We're in a series entitled uh, Transformed, and this series is based on kind of a, a, a theme for me for the year that I wanted to share with you, and, and I've got a bunch of stuff that I want to unpack in, in a couple of weeks. I don't speak next week because Jonathan and Verna will, but the following week after that is going to be part due of today, okay? And so you don't want to miss that. It'll be the final message of this particular series, and it's really connected to what I'm going to talk about today. But this this word came to me during the fast, and it was really just be transformed. And I think a lot of people are not experiencing full transformation that God has for them. And so to, un- to understand that word, it's, it's different than information. The, the Bible says in Romans 12, 2, which is our theme text, that we're, um, do not be conformed, conformed to the pattern of the world, Instead, contrast, conversely, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Pastor Chris did a great job last week talking about, you know, kind of the battle of the mind. And, um, but conformed to the world is basically, it's kind of like conformed equals copy. Transformed equals unique. God never, if you are conformed to the world and you're not transformed by God, you'll end up becoming a copy instead of the unique person that God created you to do. And in that uniqueness, Ephesians 2.10 is a great uh, text for that, in that masterpiece, that workmanship, that snowflake that's different than everybody else, in that uniqueness, God places or births a dream inside of you. He gives you a dream. You're most like your creator when you're creative. You're different than animals. Animals can't see into the future, don't believe for something that's, that's not yet come to be. Animals, the, my dad used to say, we're different than the monkeys and the penguins because we can have dreams. We can have dreams. And I'm not, I'm not talking about daydreams, everybody. I'm talking about dreams. And so um, years ago... I'm going to say 10 or 12 years ago, my dad and I, who's the founder of this ministry, uh, had a interesting conversation. And, and basically what I was observing, I, I've been in ministry 27 years now, and I've been in the church a long, long time, and I've seen a lot of church, done a lot of church. And what I observed was, and help me Jesus communicate this, is people go to church, and there's a person that they're there to follow, listen to, because of whatever, the dynamics of their gifts and personality, what they're saying. And basically, everybody rallies around one person's vision. I don't think that's really what God intended. I think that the church and the leader is supposed to help people fulfill the vision or dream that God put in them. And that, in turn, is the vision of the church. What would happen if... It wasn't just, you help me do what God called me to do. And what would happen if my vision was to help you fulfill and those two things met? So I just want you to know, as your pastor, I don't have all that figured out perfectly. But that's the heart of Connect, is to help that happen. And if you believe that, if you truly believe that, you wouldn't resist the way we try to get you to that place. There wouldn't be a reluctance. You would, you would want to dive in. You would go for it. You would jump in. And I just want you to jump in all in this year at Connect. And so I want to review kind of our vision, our purpose, kind of four things we do. In a couple weeks, I'll talk a little bit about this journey. It's, it, there's, there's, there's a rhyme to our reason here. We're not just like showing up, having meetings, you know, kumbaya, Doritos, go home. Okay? So here's our... <laughs> Here's our vision, all right? This, we have a very simple vision statement so everybody can remember it. Let's say it out loud together, okay? We exist to connect the disconnected. That's why we're called Connect Church. Now, inside that vision statement is two basic assumptions. There's more, but there's two basic assumptions. And that is that there are a lot of people that are far from God. They're disconnected from God, relationship with God. They might have religion, but they don't have relationship. They might have grown up in the church. They might have done CCD, got confirmed. They might have, you know, gone to, had a bar mitzvah and a bar mitzvah. They might have gone to Mecca. They might have gone on a missions trip with, on a humanitarian effort. They have some form of godliness, but they don't know God. They're far from God. And the Bible says there's a hole in your heart. There's a God-sized hole in your heart. There's eternity in the heart of man. God put this hole so that perhaps Acts chapter 17 says you would reach out for him. For he is not far from, very far from every, every one of you, any one of you. And so our job is to help 
make that connection. Jesus ultimately created the opportunity for the connection as the mediator between God and man. And the thing that separated God and man is our sin from the fall forward. We were born sinners, and of course, we all know we have sinned. And so to deal with that sin, God sent his only son to become sin for us, paid the debt, the price uh, the consequence of our sin was put upon him. The chastisement of our peace was put upon him. And, but by him we can be saved by grace through faith. That's all about this. That's what Jesus did. Can I have an amen out there? We never want to minimize the gospel and the sin. So that's part of our vision is to connect as many people as possible to Jesus forever. Because God the Father's ultimate vision is for his whole family and all his kids to be with him. But sin has separated us from him. So he's going out of his way by sending his one and only son for that possibility. But the possibility is there because we have, we have free will agency and we can say no or yes. We can choose life or death. We can choose be with him or do it our way. That's part of our vision. It's a big part of our vision. That's why we do church every Sunday to help people make that connection. Here's this, that's this part. Here's the other part that everybody, a lot of people... Uh, generally speaking, miss, and that is the second part, people are disconnected from their purpose. They, they might have the when and then, but they don't have the here and now. Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? And I would say to you, God has a dream that he has placed inside of you. When you make that connection, something, something fires up in your spirit, and he drops basically a treasure inside of you and there's a road map that he places inside of you that through relationship, and I believe connected to the local church, you know you should be a part of this local church when your dream fits into this church. That's how you can know if you're supposed to be here. Okay, but, but, but he put that inside of you because he wants to do something great through you. He has a dream inside of you. And so basically, we, that, that's a process, or we like to say it's a journey. It's a spiritual journey. So God, we want to help people go on a life-changing spiritual journey. And there's going to be steps to this. But what happens is a lot of us get stuck on this journey. We get this, and then we start to take a step. Er, roadblock, obstacles, problems. I'm going to talk to you today about giants that stay in the way and become dream busters for you. And so what happens is we get the first part. This is the four things we do as a church. We help people know God, come into relationship with him, learn relationship above religion. Then they, in essence, they, they get set free from their slavery to sin because of what Jesus did. Uh, they, they get the get out of jail free card and get to go to heaven, but they don't get the jailbird out of them on earth. We keep living like we're shackled, even though we've been set free. And so many people are stuck right here. We're not living optimally. We're not living life on purpose with intentionality. We're not living fulfilled Christian lives. Some of you are thinking, oh, I'm living pretty good. So I want to say something to you about that. Some of you, life is jacked up, you're sidelined, you hurt real bad. Some of you think life's pretty good. Let me just say something to you. It might be, because we live in America. And things are pretty, you, you can swipe it and get it. And you can go, you can figure out a way to pay for it and continue. And so, because we live in America and affluence and all the things that we have and, and all that, life can be pretty good. But God didn't want you to live a good life. Good is not good enough. He wanted you to live a better life. He wanted you to live an abundant life. He wanted you to live above and beyond all that you could ask or imagine. The greatest adventure is to live the dream that God has placed inside of you. Not just live a good life, but live a better life. Do you want to settle for just good? Good is not good enough. Can I have an amen out there? And so God has a dream inside of you. And your ability to dream is one of the greatest gifts he has given you. It makes you the most like God. You're most like him when that happens. So every great achievement in life starts with a dream. But some of you's dream is just, it, it's, it's in the closet. It's in the back seat. It's in the trunk of your life. It's, it, it, you, you've forgotten it. And you're not imagining anymore what God can do. Napoleon said this. He said, imagination rules the world. Napoleon said that. Look what he did. Einstein said, smartest man, maybe, some people think, imagination is more important than knowledge. 
We always think of him as, you know, head knowledge, but he's saying imagination is more important than that. Amazing. And so our, our objective, connect, I, whether you see it or not, I, I'm not we're going to keep tinkering, tweaking, playing with the dials on these four things to help move you to the place where what is the dream for my life and how do I actually effectuate it, see it become a reality. My greatest, this is what I believe as your pastor, and, and it's become more a reality, more a passion for me, but my greatest successes are yours. I, I just, I just want to, we, I'm saying, I'm saying me, but we want to plant seeds so you can succeed. I just want, we just want to come alongside, because we're going to, the needs are unlimited, but the resources are limited. The, the opportunities out there are limitless, but there's so many people that are sitting on their blessed assurance and nobody's doing what God has called them to do because they think only one person does it is the professional Christian with the biggest mouth. We're all called with a dream, and God wants to see it all, all of us see it come to pass. Can I have an amen out there, okay? And so fulfilling that vision is so huge for us. It's a big part of who we are. But for every one person that is living the dream, nine are not. Not or not. And it's because there are the, there are, there's this resistance. There's these obstacles. It's because we get stuck. And I want to submit to you, these problems get in the path of God for your life. These giants stand in the way of the, of the promise of God being fulfilled in your life. And many of you have just walked away. Many of you have just set up camp. Many of you have just resigned or even retired Oh, I did some good stuff for God in the past. Or I, I, I used to serve the church. Or I, 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 I did some things that were pretty good. I went on a mission trip years ago. Whatever. God wants to, your greatest days are ahead. 2019 four. Jesus is coming back and he's looking for people who are going to awaken the dream inside of them and actually live it. Can I have an amen? amen. I should get a better amen from this amen. church right now in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody. And so what I see, I had this picture in my mind. It was taken from Lord of the Rings. I see this, these giants. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a movie guy, okay? I mean, I'll watch one a night probably after the Super Bowl. I, I love movies. But I, I just saw this. I think some of you, you know, you're, you're trying to get out there, and, and, and there's a giant in your way, and you give up. You've even forgotten it. Some of you don't even believe it, that it's there. And so you may not face an opposing giant physically or some supernatural giant like that, but your giant could be a financial giant. I can't do that because this is in the way. I, I can't do that because of a relational problem. I can't do this because I, I, I'm physically, it, it doesn't work. I, emotional, whatever it is, there's some kind of giant blocking your dream. So what do you do? How do you face you know, those giants. How do you overcome them? We're going to talk about those, but I want to tell you four giants you're going to have to face through the lens of a story that we all know, so this will be easy for you to um, identify with, but this is, this is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 17, the story of David and Goliath, but I promise you, you probably haven't heard this side of it, okay? So here's kind of a big idea for facing your giants. giants. Write this down. To be transformed, you're going to have to face some giants, Malcolm Gladwell, a well-known author of many books, wrote a book recently entitled The Story of Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. And he had some insights that deeply affected me. And I'm going to give the context uh, to this text, first 1 through 11 of 1 Samuel 17. In this passage, there are, there are some unique complexities to it that I think Many of us miss, including myself, okay? And so let me give you the context for the text. Here's what's up. There's these two huge armies that are coming to face each other. There are these seafaring people known as the Philistines. I sometimes think of them as Klingons. Man, this is a tough crowd. And so, so these seafaring people, these, 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 these Philistines, come the perennial enemies of the Israelites, and they're along the coastline on top of a mountain. And in the middle of this is this valley, and there's another group of people on top of another mountain, the Israelites, and they're facing each other, and they're in this standoff because if, they, if one of them comes down the side of the mountain, they'll be vulnerable. And if the other one comes down, they'll be, so nobody's going to give up their strategic advantage. And so they're at this standoff. In the midst of this frustration that both sides are feeling, the Philistines take action and they send, this is kind of out of the rules of engagement of war 3,000 years ago, they send their champion to go out to represent their armies. And this champion is known as Goliath. 
And so Goliath confronts the Israelites. And the rules of engagement say that Israel needed to provide a champion. And at some point in time, they do not provide a champion. By default, the Philistines win and Israel has to submit and yield. Most people don't know that. So Saul, or the kingdom of Israel, had to provide a champion. But they were having a hard time with that when they saw this massive human being, um, you know, come out from the crowd. And amidst this situation, you know this to be true, and there comes this, this kid, this shepherd, this sheep boy, comes out, and he's visiting at the time, and he's like, hey, who's this guy? You know, who's, uh, who, why is nobody, why, who's letting him say that? I'll take him. I'll take him on. I can take him out. Everybody's just, a whole bunch of story that comes with that. Somehow he gets before Saul. Saul, somehow later, and I'll unpack these details, is convinced that, that this is our best shot. <laughs> and they put David out there in front of the giant. And so David comes down, the down from the hill, down into the valley. He faces the giant. You know the story. The giant starts being offended. You come at me, you know, this boy, I'll feed you to the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. And you come at me with sticks. And he's, he's offended. And David just says, you come at me, I come at you. And he picks up his sling. He flings a stone, hits him square in the forehead. His skull is penetrated. He falls to the ground, knocked out. David goes over, grabs Goliath's own sword, cuts off his head. This is the story of David and Goliath. We all know that. But a closer look at the story, I came to realize and I believe there's a lot of things that I thought were true that are not true. And I think it's relevant to me overcoming my, my obstacles, my giants, my problems. And I think it's relevant to you so that we can fulfill the dream of God for our life. And when I look at some of these things... I, Basically, the story has been, has been captured as, in a nutshell, the, the ultimate underdog story. Right? David, little kid, Goliath, nine feet plus. His spearhead weighed 15 pounds. To throw that hundreds of yards with accuracy? I don't know if you've lifted up a 15-pound dumbbell recently. I did this morning. I can toss it. Pretty good, but not accurate, and certainly not something I'm going to do for war. That's crazy. It was on the end of a massive javelin. But this story became a metaphor for underdogs and long shots. We all know that. But why do we think that? See, some common reasons are Goliath's a giant, David's a kid. Uh, Goliath is an experienced warrior. Um, Goliath is... Obviously, in the story, tricked out with all the modern weaponry that you could possibly get as a soldier. But here's some key info you might not have, and it will, will particularize it with two personalities in a minute. In ancient times, 3,000 years ago, there were three types of warriors. There were the cavalry, horsemen, chariots. There were the infantry, the foot soldiers, which made up usually most of the army. And there were the artillery. Now listen, the artillery were the bow and arrow and slingers. Now a sling was made up of two leather strips connected with a pouch in the middle. You'd put a stone inside that. You'd grab these two leather strips, and you would whip that thing around, and a slinger could whip this thing around six to seven times per second and could throw that baby at 35 meters per second. And they've done studies, ballistic studies, that supposedly when it struck somebody, it had the stopping power of a 45 caliber pistol. So in reality... In reality, a slingshot was a dangerous, dangerous weapon and had no problem dropping the giant if it hit him. So the story starts to change. As to accuracy, slingers were so well trained, they could knock a bird flying in the air out of the sky. So actually, who had the advantage? So David comes down from the mountain, and, and, and the giant is confronting him. Come to me. Why is he saying come to me? Because he, he, he wants to have a sword fight. But David wasn't stupid. David brought a sling shot to a sword fight. 
He had superior weaponry. In fact, slingers were used as the number one defense against infantry. Slingers and bow and arrow people. The story begins to change. Certain things begin to be different. Goliath, let's talk about him. He was heavy infantry. Um, and so it, it, on an infantry level, if it was a soldier's battle, it was a mismatch. Come to me, you know, let's have this sword fight. But again, David's not stupid. He changes the rules. He has superior technology. Plus, he has the spirit of God with him. I believe that if he slung that and he missed, that stone would have come back around, had GPS on it, and just knocked him out, everybody. A God positioning system would have taken that Goliath right down in just a second. Amen. Can I have an amen out there? And so we think he's an underdog? See, we misunderstand Goliath. He was actually, many different texts, you can see a few little nuggets, but all of them consistently basically point out that he was led out onto the, the field in the valley by an attendant. He had to be led out. He walked very, very slowly when he was coming out. He, he seemed confused as to why is David coming down here? What is happening? What is he doing? And, and, and maybe he was saying, when he said, come to me, he wasn't saying, come to me. He was saying, come to me, because I can't see you. <laughs> see, endocrinologists, this is a, kind of a big word, but basically they study uh, 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 giantism. And, 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 and most people believe, I personally believe, that um, people, we know people who've had acromegalia, acro, um, acromegalia is the term, but basically people like, Andre the Giant, you guys remember the Canadian wrestler? Yep. Seven feet plus, whatever. Uh, he had uh, the same problem. Um, there was the, 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 the tallest man in the world, uh, listed in Guinness Book of World Records, was eight feet, 11 inches tall. He had acromeglia. And basically what it is, is it's a tumor on the pituitary gland. And what it's in the brain. And what it does is it, it increases your HGH, your human, human growth hormone. And so it causes you to continue to grow, 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 grow. But this tu not only as your body grows, so does the tumor. And as the tumor grows, it compresses on your optic nerve. So most people with this giantism, this acromeglia, basically they have, over time, problems with their eyesight. And so when you look at this story, just scientifically, you look at this story, why was he walking slowly? Why did he have an attendant help him? Why? Because he was afraid he would trip, because he couldn't see. Why was he calling to David, come closer, come closer, because he couldn't see. Why does he say, you come to me with sticks? Because he had double vision. <laughs> Maybe. Are you guys tracking with me out there? It's a common side effect of, uh, side effect of acromaglia. And so many people believe this. And what's interesting, and I just think this was a kind of a cool takeaway, and I think this is more likely the case. Basically, um, the, the, the story is kind of different. But basically, the very thing that others saw as Goliath's greatest strength was the very thing that David saw as his greatest weakness. David came to a sword fight with a slingshot. He actually had the advantage in this situation, not Goliath. And so don't be fooled as we continue this message today. Don't be fooled by the giants in your life because a lot of times the appearances are just that. They're just appearances. The glittering armor, the loud voice, uh, uh, the size sometimes of the giants. See, giants aren't always what they appear to be. And some of you have submitted to certain giants, and as a result, you're not seeing the dream of God fulfilled in your life. And though you may never face a physical giant like David did, in order to see your dream come to fruition, you're going to have to face some different giants. I want to introduce you to four of them that David had to face before he faced the giant and saw the dream that God had for him to become king come to fruition, he had to face these different giants. The first giant, the dream buster of delay. Everybody say delay. In 1 Samuel 16, I'm going to paraphrase, summarize scriptures for the sake of time this morning, but you can look these up and see the context of this. But in 1 Samuel 16, David is anointed to be king by the prophet Samuel while Saul was king at that moment. That's a little shady, scary, whatever. You wouldn't want anybody to know that. But Samuel goes and, and God says, I'm going to show you it's one of Jesse's sons. Jesse brings seven of his eight sons to the, to the scene. David's not there. He's the eighth son. Sam, you know the story. He goes through all seven sons. That's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one. Don't you have another one? And Jesse's like, well, yeah, I have David, but he's out. He's a sheep. He's taking care of the sheep. Well, get him. And so he goes and gets David. Sure enough, David's the one. And 
and Samuel anoints him to be king. Here's what's so crazy. Between the time he got anointed and the time he got appointed to be king, there was a delay. Now, sometimes we face delays because our character needs to be developed. Sometimes there's a process. Sometimes we need certain people to help us. But sometimes there's delay because people are causing us to be delayed. And in this case, his father held him back. In fact, his father's, in so many words, he's basically like, that's great. You're going to be king? Go, we'll talk about that. Go out there and take care of those sheep. And look at this in verse uh, 12 through 15. I'll just go to verse 15. It says, but David, David was the youngest of the, three bro- of the seven brothers, eight brothers. The three oldest went on with Saul, but David went back and forth. One translation says, was held back from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. See, listen, you need to know something. If somebody's going to try to hold you back for you being able to fulfill the dream of God in your life. Perhaps something's trying to hold you back. Maybe somebody says it's your age. Maybe somebody says it's your gender. Maybe somebody says it's your race. Maybe somebody says you don't look right. You don't, you don't fit the part. You, you're, you're not right for this role. Whatever discriminates against you can be the giant in your life. You need to recognize that for what it is. And I say this with respect, but in many respects, my dad was, was what caused me to, to see the, 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 the call of God fulfilled in my life, the dream come to fruition, to, to come into ministry. But it, sometimes he held me back sometimes. And, and I didn't have the guts. I didn't have, the, I didn't have sometimes the crucial conversations that were necessary. That, and I was allowing delay to continue, 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 because I, I lived in fear. Is everybody tracking with me? And so sometimes people, the people that hold you back are the people that love you most. I'm not trying to bust up families. I'm not trying to break down your relationship with your father, your mother, your brother, your sister. I'm just trying to say follow Father God and what he put inside of you and what he told you to do trumps anything that any man would say. You do what God says ultimately in Jesus' name. Amen? Because God has a plan for you. But people have a plan for you too. And you better be careful about that. Because people will try to tell you what the plan should be. Uh, finally, David is allowed to, to leave the nest. But interestingly enough, it's not to go and fulfill the dream and, and become king. No, he says, I want you to go bring some cheese and bread to your brothers. I want you to go to Domino's and I want you to deliver some pizza pizza to your brothers. And so David's allowed to go but under that premise. And as he goes, he faces the next giant. This is known as the giant of discouragement. Everybody say discouragement. And so what happens here is while he's along the battle lines, he can see that everybody there is fearful. Everybody there is freaking out. In verse 11 of that chapter, it says, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and they were terrified. The New Living Translation says they were so frightened they couldn't do a thing. They were paralyzed. And what happens is paralyzing people will try to paralyze the dream of God in your life. They'll try to discourage you and bring you into that mental disease, into that, 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 uh, that reverse, you know, that fear and faith sometimes have the same definition but a, but a different decision. Fear and faith have the same definition but a different decision. And so what happens is fearful people try to get you to make the wrong decision about the situation that's actually happening. This is the second barrier to your dream. And sometimes it appears to be conventional wisdom. And I would submit to you sometimes conventional wisdom is wrong. It's not always right when it's connected to your God dream. Sometimes the solution doesn't come from ranks or rank and file. Sometimes it comes from an outside source. While while Goliath was berating and attacking the armies of Israel, the ranks of Israel, the rank and file was then trying to discourage David. But David came in from the outside with an outside perspective, a fresh set of eyes and said, why is everybody freaking out? I can take him, as my daddy would say, we can take that sucker. That's so what my daddy would say. We can take that. I don't know if that's good for church, but that's what, would, that's, that's what would happen. Isn't it interesting that all those people were there, all those experts of war were there, but it took a kid from the outside to see what really needed to happen. Some of you need to be careful who you're listening to. Some of you listen to the wrong voices. The Bible says for 40 days, twice a day, morning and evening, this Philistine just, and they were listening to it, and they were believing it. Listen, some of you guys, I don't, this, I don't know how it goes with the girls. It could be something else. You got girlfriends. But guys listen to talk radio. Talk radio? Come on. You need to be careful what you're listening to. 
Because you can listen to negative, 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 negative. You know what happens? You get negative. Well, we're listening to the experts on this. We're listening to the experts on that. That might be keeping you. I'm not saying all talk radio is bad. Please don't get me wrong. I'm just trying to say that sometimes you're listening to the wrong voices. And it's keeping you from fulfilling the dream of God in your life. You need some people who believe in you, some people who support you. Some people see the dream that's inside you, the vision that's inside you. Sometimes somebody believing you is more powerful than the vision God gave you. I, I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for my wife. Honest God, I wouldn't be here. There's so many people that didn't believe in me, so many people. Listen, listen, I, there's some situations that have happened when you decide to live the dream that God has for you and you believe what he put inside you, not what somebody else says about you. I mean, the university that I went to, I got kicked out of the university, kicked out, okay? And a few years ago, I don't remember, I preached to the whole school just a few years ago. I serve on a board to the president of that university. Only God, only God could do that. I'm, I, I'm just getting ready. Come on. I, I, I was getting ready to get on the stage. And my heart rate was just pounding. I was just like, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is happening. I'm getting ready to preach the school I got kicked out of. And there's a whole story behind that. It's incredible. I wasn't the man you know right now. I was, I was jacked up, messed up. And God took my mess and made a message. And, he said, and then I just stepped in. I felt the presence of God, the favor of God. And he spoke through me to that student body. It was a big day. It was a big day. Don't. Don't hang around fearful people. Don't, don't, it's fear and faith are contagious. You need to decide which camp you're going to be in. Disapproval. Write this down. The third giant is disapproval. Man. See, if you're going to go after your dream, there's always going to be naysayers, people, critics, people who don't believe in you, people who don't even like you. It's the truth. We like to be liked. But you have to decide if you want the approval of God more than the approval of men. That's going to be a big part of you seeing the dream of God in your life. Some of you don't see the, the dream of God as that important or that rewarding. And that's what's keeping you from overcoming. You don't see the incentive. Everything God has for you has rewards, has incentives to it. He wants to bless you beyond what you could imagine. But you're going to have to overcome the giant of disapproval. David gets, in verse 26 through 29, he comes on the scene and he starts asking people, what's the reward if I kill this giant? What's the reward? And everybody misinterpreted it. And you know what? Some of you get shut down because people have said, you cocky little punk, who do you think you are? See, sometimes, originally, because what God did in you is so miraculous, and you know who you were, and you know who you are in Christ. Like me, I, I'm getting ready to preach, do this thing. I didn't think I was all that. I was like, I can't believe you're going to let me do this. I can't believe this. I can't believe my friends, the president of the university, the president 20 years ago, 25 years ago, kicked me out. I can't believe this guy. See, I didn't have confidence in Derek. I had a God confidence, but somebody else could look at that situation and say, who do you think you are? You know what I mean? You conceited little punk. What, what do you think you're doing? Don't let somebody misinterpret God confidence for cockiness. See, God can, but some of you have allowed what they say to can your God and put him in a little box, and you went in that little box with him. You need to come out of that and believe God and what he says about you. But sometimes that's not what happens. And so the elder brother, the one close to him, who thought he knew him, judged his motives. And, 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 I, and I don't know about you. I don't know if you've had people close to you. They claim to know you, but they really don't know you. The only one who really knows you is God, and those people who, who believe in you really know you. What's the reward? And so David's elder brother says, why are you even here anyway? Why aren't you taking care of your scrawny little flock of sheep, you cocky little brat? I know how conceited you are. David says, now what have I done? All I did, can I just ask a question? Look at this sibling rivalry that's taking place. See, family often can't see or imagine what you can be. Sometimes family's envious, jealous, insecure, things like that. The, there's this principle that says familiarity sometimes breeds contempt. Jesus experienced this himself. I'm going to preach. I don't, the clock's going to be whatever. And so Jesus experienced this himself. Yes, amen. Jesus. Imagine what it was like for Jesus. So Mary and Joseph have Jesus, right? You know, this amazing virgin birth. Blah, blah. And, but after that, you know, Mary and Joseph had kids. And so Jesus had brothers and sisters. And, 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 they, ha and they didn't follow him till after the resurrection. I, I would imagine it would be hard to follow 
Jesus and believe he was the son of God before the resurrection. You know what I mean? It's like there's a fight and something's going on in the living room and Mary comes in and goes, what's going on here? What's going on? Oh, it's Jesus' fault. Jesus, did you say anything? No, I didn't say anything. Okay. You guys, you know it's your fault because Jesus is perfect. I mean, that had to be, that had to be terrible. That had to be terrible. I know he's perfect, so... Brother, my brother's perfect. Uh, Mr. Per- Mr. Perfect. Mr. Perfect. Mr. Perfect. Right? But they all followed him after. After the resurrection, they believed. In fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, doesn't, doesn't name drop. He doesn't say, Jesus, my brother. No, he says, he says, I am a servant of my Lord Jesus. His whole heart was changed because the proof was in the pudding. Can I have an amen? And so, so the real conceited one was the brother in this story with David. And people will misinterpret confidence sometimes as cocky. And so sometimes what happens is you, you, the size of your dream will determine the size of your God. Some of you have shrunk your dream and correspondingly you have shrunk your God. You need to see the dream for what it really is. Can I have an Amen. Here's the fourth, the fourth thing. The fourth dream buster is doubt. Doubt. The experts doubted David's ability to defeat the giant. See, there will be important people in your life who doubt you. And there'll be these people in your life who you've allowed in, good or bad, and their words have weight. In David's case, the king doubted his ability. There was nobody, perhaps more an expert on the battlefield than Saul at this time. He stood ahead taller than everybody else, and he was a great and mighty warrior. And so we see this in verse 32 and 33, and Saul speaks to him as David tells him, I can defeat him. And Saul says, that's ridiculous. There's no way you can go against the Philistine. You're only a boy, and he's a professional warrior for his whole life. I think it would be really tough to hear from the king, you can't do it. Some of you have had somebody who's really important, an expert, tell you, you can't do it. I want to say, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that. But I would say, just like conventional wisdom can sometimes be wrong, so can the experts. They can be wrong, too. When I was in college, go back to that, I had a professor. I won't mention his name, though I want to, if I'm honest. But I had a professor. I was in, a, I was in the cemetery. I mean, seminary. And in the seminary... <laughs> Glory to God. When I was in the seminary, I had a class. I, I, knew I, was called, I knew I was called to do what I'm doing right now when I was 15 years old, but I struggled with it because of insecurity. I was shy. I didn't want to get in front of people. I know that's hard to believe. But when I got to college, I started to get set free, and I realized that God had a gift to communicate. And so I would get up and communicate. And to be honest with you, I, I killed it. Like, I mean, that's good for some of you who have been around a long time. And, and my professor would stick his finger out in front of the whole class. And he would say, Fry, Derek Fry, you will never be a public communicator or a pastor. That was the most piss poor. He said that. Piss, this is a Christian, spirit filled. Piss poor message I've ever heard. I was 19 years old. What if I believe that? What if I believe that? Thank God I didn't believe that. But I believe the dream of God in my life. I accepted what he said about me, not what an expert said about me. Thank God. So how do you reach your dreams? We've got to do what David did. Write this down. Write this down. To reach your dreams, you have to remind yourself how God has helped you before. When I recall like I just did, and I recollect, God did this? Of course he can do that. When I remember that I couldn't, but then he did. Remember that I, I, I didn't know how it would happen, but then it happened. It encourages me. Remind yourself. David did that when he faced The expert, Saul's interpretation, and David said, I respectfully, Saul, I hear what you're saying, but you know what? God has helped me to defeat a lion and a bear. And let me tell you something, this Philistine has nothing on my God. And sometimes you have to remind yourself. Number two, you have to use the tools that God has given you now. Listen, key word, now. Circle that. See, I don't, you don't wait for something to get in order to get started. You get started and things will get in order. If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never see anything happen. Just telling a girl this at the door after last service. But you got to start with what you have now. Some of you are waiting for, I need more education. Oh, I need more money. Oh, I'm going to need more help. I'm going to need more opportunity. No, start with what God has put in your hand right now. And there's always going to be a group. There's always going to be a person that will try to get you to do it their way. They, some people will come alongside you and they'll say, I'm for you. But put on my armor. 
I, 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 that's a great idea, but let's do it like this. What does that mean? Your, their way, not, not God's way. See, when you put on someone else's armor, it's going to be so heavy, you won't, you'll never fulfill the dream of God for your life when you put on someone else's armor. You wear, you use what God has given you. Some of you in business, some of you in ministry are a copy. You're conforming. You're a copy of what somebody else is doing down the street, something you learned online, and it's okay to follow principles and patterns, but there is something unique and powerful that God has put inside of you that he didn't put inside of anybody else that is going to reproduce, that's going to multiply those God ideas, is, that's going to take them to the far regions of the earth. He's going to use you to help other people. And you've got to accept that, what God has done for you. David said in verse 38 and 34, uh, Saul tried to dress them in his armor. He said, I can't go out in these. I'm not used to them. So he took them off, please. And he, and he picked up five smooth stones uh, with his sling. Don't fall prey to Saul's syndrome, Saul's armor syndrome, because you're bound to fail if you do. Don't minimize your slingshot. Don't minimize that. Amen? Number three, ignore the dream busters. Ignore the dream busters. David did this on his whole journey. Listen, this... This is tough, you know? This is why you need church. Some of you, God's giving you a dream, but... You're not connected to the right people. That's why we exist at Connect. That's why we do small groups, because you're going to need to get around some people who believe in you, encourage you, and help you on this journey to see the dream, the vision that God's placed in your life. And, and, and you're going to have to learn some stuff to remind yourself, but you're going to need people help you, show you how to do that, because sometimes we don't even know how to do that. But David, David didn't have anybody encourage him, nobody. And to take on this giant, you know what I mean? He, he had all these people discouraged. His dad... His mom, his brothers, the army, the king, nobody gave him a high five. Not one person gave him an boy. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, the Bible says, so what did he do? The Bible says David strengthened himself in the Lord. That's why I encourage you sometimes to not just come to church, just, just, just do church, just go in and out. Like, you need to get on fire for God. I mean, you need to get fired up in 2019. You need to walk away. Stop conforming to this world and be renewed in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in your mind and be transformed by the renewing of your mind and really just fall in love with Jesus. Get on fire. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Encourage yourself. Build yourself up, Jude 20 says, in your most holy faith. You must learn how to encourage yourself because what the world offers as a substitute is positive thinking. And let me tell you something. It's going to get bad. It's going to get worse. Those giants will get bigger. Pastor, could you be more positive? I'm positive it's going to get worse. And you can't just, say, you can't just offer some, you know, it's going to be a better day tomorrow. Buenos dias. You know what I mean? No, it's going to be, ay caramba. It's going to be, Dios mio. It's going to be, hace calor. It's going to be bad. Muy malo. It's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And so you can't just have positive thinking, flowers and, you know, and, 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 you know, and tulips and, uh, you know, and stars. No, you're going to need a bedrock trust in God, a relationship with God, and learn how to trust him that it's his grace, it's his power, it's his security, it's his wisdom, it's his provision, it's his timing that's going to get you through. You need that for yourself. That's what David did because there's some big giants out there and they're so significant and mental, you know, a good mental attitude and a positive attitude. I'm sorry. That's all great. I'd rather you be positive than negative, but that's not enough to overcome those tough days. Is everybody with me? Final point. Everybody say final point. Say, I'm so sad because this has been so good. Expect God to help me for his glory. Expect God to help me for his glory. David had this, this faith factor. That was unique. He put God's reputation on the line. He got off the safety of the hill into the valley and put himself in a vulnerable position, a certain level of risk that if he was in himself, he would fail. But because he put his trust in God, God, I think God just had to come through. In 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 47, uh, David basically, you know the story, Saul's coming at him. And, and David says, you come at me, I come 
at you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defied this day, the Lord who I serve will deliver you into my hand, not me into your hand, and I'll strike your head from you. He had this confidence. And then he says, I'm doing all this. You think you're going to turn me over to the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, but you need to know something. The whole world's going to see right now because see all those guys up there in the hill and you see all those guys up on there. In just a second, the whole world's going to see that there's a God. There, come on, say it with me. There's a God in Israel. You need to put yourself in a position where you expect God to do something amazing. And you need to get off your blessed assurance. You need to get down from that comfort place. You need to get down in that valley of indecision, that valley of doubt. You need to say, you know what? It's not me. It's going to be God. You watch this. Everybody watching? Everybody watching? The God of Israel is getting ready to do something big. And your head is going to be mine in just a minute. Whoo! The battle is the Lord's. Amen. Man, 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 man. What, what, what are you expecting God to do? I asked you this a few weeks ago with your goals. I'm going to keep coming. What are you expecting God to do in your life? Let me tell you something. Without knowing the answer, God is doing exactly what you're expecting him to do. He's doing what you're expecting him to do. I want to awaken dreams in here. And people believe again. But you're going to have to overcome some giants. And every time you move out like David did, I just think, I just think God loves that. Every, 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 according to your faith, be it done unto you. The just shall live by faith. Without faith, it's impossible, impossible to please God. What a cool story. But it can be your story. I think the greatest adventure awaits you. And I, this is what I think about myself so you don't misinterpret as we close today. I, I'm just a nobody with a slingshot. And so are you. You need to use what's in your hand. You need to realize what God gave you. We want to help you with that, Connect. Because your unbelief can be keeping someone or something great from happening this year. Because God wants to do something great through you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as I pray for you? With every head bowed, every eye closed, be still before a holy God because His presence is here. Will you commit going forward? Not to just do church, but be the church. Would you commit to be people who just outrageous faith? Be willing to take some risks, to be bold and courageous, to come out of your comfort zone, out of your safe places. It all comes down to a choice. Yes, the choice about when and then, heaven or hell. The choice about the here and now as well. What are you going to do with what God's put in your heart? If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, it is not an accident that you're here today. And you might be feeling something going on inside of you. I would just say to you, that's the Spirit of God knocking on your heart. You need to just respond. And I want to give you that chance to do that. It's an awesome opportunity that you have that can literally change your life. Because there's a hole in your heart that only God can fill. But you have to say yes. Yes, I need you, God. Yes, I can't do it without you. Yes, I may be living good, but I want to live better. Yes, life is jacked up, and I know only you can fix it. If that's you and you know God is speaking to you, I want you to boldly raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to come into relationship with God. Don't want to go another day. Raise a good night. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't miss it. Keep it up. Keep it up. That's awesome. That's awesome. Let God see you. Let me see you. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your boldness. You can put your hands down. Now, if you know you're one of those people when I was talking and you're stuck, you, 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 haven't, you haven't seen the dream fulfilled because giants have opposed you and you haven't overcome them and you know that and God wants, to, God wants to help you and you're believing that today is a defining moment and you want to move past those. And Jesus, if that's you, raise your hand. Say, that's me. I want to go past my giants. I want the dream to be fulfilled in my life all over the room, all over the room. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just, let's just invite God. Just say this prayer with me. Just, just, it's, all, it's all him now. But you just, you just say this as a confession of your heart. Say, Jesus, whether it be for the first time or a fresh time, I need you in my life. I can't do it without you. Thank you that you dealt with the when and then. And because of what you did, I can be with you forever. But now, in the here and now, I know you put a dream in my heart, and I want to live it. I don't want to just survive. I don't want to just go through the motions. I don't want to just suck air, take up space, take up God's grace. I want to do something great for God, and I declare it, that God has put a dream in me, 
and it's going to come to fruition in Jesus' name. And I decide today to go all in. Let me pray for you. Father, if those people that said that, I pray they go all into the local church. That's what that, all into relationship. And they submit to the call and plan of God. And they don't do it by themselves. Lord, help them to overcome their giants. Thank you for those people that said yes to Jesus and their eternity has changed. But I also say thank you for those people who are ready to overcome their giants, those dream busters, so the dream can be fulfilled in Jesus' name. And all God's church said, a big, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand clap for his word. Come on up, there. Wow. Thank you, Jesus.